Today we're going to be talking about action. This topic is, is really interesting because there's a lot of researchers that believe that the brain's evolution, the main function was action. That the brain solely evolved to be able to move, to, be able to coordinate different regions and space and all that kind of stuff. So what you'll notice throughout this lecture is that this capitalizes on almost everything that we've talked about so far. All right, and that's kind of tying into what those researchers believe. If the brain really did evolve primarily to move, then that means that all of the different parts of the brain are involved in some way in these action plans and in initiating action. So you're going to see a lot of what we've already gone over come up in this. So, so we'll get into it. So I was kind of hinting at the fact that action is really, really important in terms of what the brain is deciding to do. It's, uh, it's what it kind of focuses a lot of its energy on. Uh, so today we're going to kind of explore how these action mechanisms work. We're going to start with kind of going through the regions that are involved. And I kind of hinted this is going to touch on a ton of stuff that we've already gone over already because it's, it's taking advantage of all of these processing pathways to make plans to move. Uh, we're going to look at how that movement is generated, kind of zoom in and look at the cellular level and what single cell recordings are telling us about it. Uh, and then we'll kind of zoom back out and we'll look at goal selection and how motor planning is happening kind of in the frontal lobe and how those plans are then chosen and initiated. Uh, we'll look at links between perception and action. There's going to be stuff about mirror neurons, which is really, really cool. Uh, and then at the end, we'll dive into some of the subcortical stuff. Uh, this is kind of the older brain regions, the ones that are phylogenetically older. Uh, so this is how motion works in a lot of uh, lower order animals. And look at how error prediction works in like the cerebellum. Cool. So we'll start with the anatomy of attention. So you'll notice that a ton of brain regions are highlighted here. So some of the main ones that I want you to focus on are going to be M1. So this is our primary motor cortex. It's the kind of back end of the frontal lobe. Uh, we also have the secondary areas, which are secondary motor area and supplementary motor areas and Broca's right here. So for speech type stuff, uh, frontal cortex is really important for integrating a bunch of information and adding to the plans that are happening. Uh, and then this stuff over here is kind of our subcortical pathway. So basal ganglia is really important for initiating movement and cerebellum is really, really important for uh, kind of fine-tuning the uh, motion plans and also for predicting what's going to happen and figuring out what went wrong if something did go wrong. So this whole entire system is kind of organized in this hierarchy of control. So at the top, we have these cortical areas that I was, I was referring to. So we have like primary motor cortex and the secondary motor areas. And these ones form what's called the pyramidal tract. And this is going to be a really important term. I, I want you guys to be able to differentiate between these two different tracks um, because this one is, is a much newer addition in evolution that allows us to do some pretty amazing things. Um, the older one is coming from a lot of these subcortical regions, so basal ganglia and cerebellum. Uh, this one is called the extrapyramidal tract. Um, this pyramidal thing is referring to when it passes through the medulla, it kind of looks like a pyramid down here. Um, and these ones just refer to these are outside of the cortical control type stuff. So this is projections that are coming straight from those, those deep old brain structures. So at the bottom of this hierarchy is the spinal cord. And the spinal cord is uh, responsible for turning those motion plans into actual patterns of muscle movement. Um, and we'll see later on in the, in the lecture, it's really cool how this works. Uh, we'll look at how muscle memory kind of ties into a lot of this stuff. Spinal cord is able to do a lot of stuff without any input from the cortex, actually. So, so something just really important that I want you to know, pyramidal is coming from the cortex, extra pyramidal is coming from subcortical stuff. So newer in evolution, older in evolution. So we're going to start kind of at the bottom of that hierarchy and we're going to work our way up. So we're going to start with the muscles that are kind of the receivers of the commands. So uh, an effector is some part of the body that can move. So this is referring to the muscles that are moving the different limbs and all that kind of stuff. Um, they're activated by motor neurons and they're composed of these, these fibers that when you apply electrical stimulation to them, they contract. 
And that's a really important idea because I want you guys to remember that each of our muscles are organized in these antagonistic pairs. Um, that's almost every single muscle that you have in your body has another muscle that's doing the opposite of what it does. And so this is a, a good example of that. So this is flexion and extension of the elbow joint. So if we're extending the elbow, if we're extending the arm and straightening out the arm, we're actually contracting our tricep. And you can feel it in the back when you extend that arm. And at the same time, we're relaxing the bicep. So the tricep is getting contracted, bicep is lengthening. And then when we flex that elbow, the exact opposite is happening. So the bicep is contracting, tricep is lengthening. So they're working kind of in opposition to one another. Um, and that's something that you see with all the different muscle groups throughout the body. So, and I'll, I'll kind of show you how this antagonism works um, with these motor neurons at the cellular level in this next slide right here. So these are the endpoints of the actin system. So these are, the, the final uh, command por portion. These are the ones that are actually delivering the signal to the things that do move. That's what I mean by endpoint. So alpha motor neurons. So I, I don't want you to worry too much about uh, the gamma ones that I'm gonna talk about. These are the ones that I really want you to focus on. So alpha motor neurons are the ones that are actually initiating the movement. And this was a question on the last exam. Uh, what is acetylcholine used for? It's used to uh, contract skeletal muscle. So this is a neurotransmitter that's found really, really abundantly in the peripheral nervous system. And it's the main neurotransmitter that these alpha motor neurons use to be able to initiate the movement. Uh, gamma motor neurons are part of the proprioceptive system. So this was also a question on the last test. This is one that I went over in the last lecture. So these ones are the ones that are giving the brain some kind of sense of how stretched out that muscle is. And our brain is using the comparison of all these different muscles of which ones are stretched and which ones aren't to kind of get an idea of where those limbs are in space. And this right here was what I was just hinting at on that, that last slide, uh, is that these, these motor neurons can be both excitatory and inhibitory. And this is what allows for the antagonist nature that we were just looking at. So if going back to the example of bending my arm, so if I am flexing my arm, I'm exciting the bicep and I'm inhibiting the tricep. So when you inhibit the tricep, it allows it to relax and stretch. When you excite the bicep, it contracts it and brings in, uh, brings in the limb, flexes the elbow. So, the two things on here, remember that alpha, mo alpha motor neurons are the ones that are actually doing a lot of the work and that they can be both excitatory and inhibitory. And this kind of plays into what I had highlighted on that last slide about the fact that they are antagonistic in nature. This is how that is happening. So moving from the motor neurons, because we're kind of working back up that hierarchy from the bottom up. Uh, so the next thing would be the spinal cord. And we've talked a little bit throughout the class about reflexes in general. There's, uh, in most animals, there are these, uh, these pathways that are outside of control, of top-down control of the organism. Um, and this one in particular is really cool. It's, uh, there's sensory receptors in the muscles that we just talked about that give the brain some kind of a clue about how stretched out that muscle is. And they have a sense of how stretched the muscle should be. And they can send that information. If, if a muscle is stretched more than it's supposed to be, it sends a signal to the spinal cord. And that spinal cord activates the alpha neurons and, and puts things back to where they should be. This is really important for posture. So this is something that we're not necessarily paying attention to at all. We have these, these systems in place that are deciding whether or not those muscles are in the right place. And when they're not, they're just initiating this reflex pathway that doesn't go to the brain at all. It's just saying, straighten these things back out. This is very habitual. And as we'll see, these reflex pathways are something that the cortex is able to kind of suppress and modulate. It's saying, don't do reflexive things, do what I tell you to do. 
So just know that these, these things are really important for posture. The stretch reflex is really important for maintaining posture. And they kind of, they, they learn as you go through life, uh, what states the muscles are in most often. And so if you have really bad posture, uh, your, your motor neurons are going to continue to give signals to keep your posture bad. But if you start training yourself, you start pulling your shoulders back and standing up tall and training these muscles that that's the new normal, then these ones are going to start doing that automatically. There's like little things you can buy that will actually, you can wear for like 15 minutes a day that'll pull your shoulders back and teach these things to be in the right position. Kind of cool how that works. Um, and that's something that as we go through this lecture, you'll see that like the cortical uh, input about motion is really fine tuning these reflexes. It's changing these reflexes so that they do the right thing all the time. So kind of moving up the hierarchy, we have extra pyramidal. So this is what I was referring to as kind of the older uh, evolutionary system that's really controlled by these subcortical things. So the, the nuclei deep down in the brain. So they descend from these subcortical structures. The main ones we're going to talk about are basal ganglia and cerebellum. And this is something I've been hinting at a lot. So we'll see in kind of slides later on in the lecture that there are a lot of really complex movements that animals without cortex can achieve. And it's because this motor system is still really, really powerful. Um, it's just, it's a lot more habitual. It's things that, that are learned, instinct, done over and over and over again. So this is something that I'll come back to that uh, I probably guarantee will be a test question. Um, there is uh, an underlying term on a future slide, but this is highlighting this idea that this is an indirect control of spinal activity. So what's, what's happening is that these extra pyramidal tracts that are coming from subcortical stuff they go down the spinal cord and then they synapse on an inner neuron. And that inner neuron is the one that actually sends the signal to the alpha neuron. And so there's like an extra step in the process. So these extra pyramidal tracks, they go down the spinal cord, they tell something to tell the muscles to do something. Whereas we'll see with the pyramidal tracks, that's much different. This newer evolutionary system has direct control of the muscles. Uh, it goes right to the alpha neurons that we were talking about. I'll show you that on the next slide. So keep in mind that this is an older system. It's more habitual um, and it's more indirect. It's not actively controlling the muscles. It's just sending signals to the spinal cord and then the spinal cord is controlling the muscles. So, the pure, oh, so I'm just gonna quickly go through some of these. We'll come back to these when we go over subcortical stuff at the end. Uh, but this is just to kind of prime you of which structures we're talking about. So we've talked a lot about the cerebellum already. Uh, pretty amazing that this thing, this little piece of cauliflower in the back of our brain, uh, contains three-fourths of all of the neurons in the brain. Uh, it's really hard to study, so a lot of its functions still kind of remain a mystery. Uh, and a lot of that is because of where it's at. It's hard to get reliable signal because of the structure and the way that things are kind of formatted in the cerebellum. But there's some new evidence that we're gonna go over here at the end. Uh, and this is gonna come up as something that's highlighted later as well, is that cerebellum is really, really important in predicting outcomes. It's, we have these action plans. We decide that we wanna move something. We decide to throw a dart at a dartboard. And we predict that that action is going to cause that dart to hit the, the bullseye. And then we have feedback from our visual system that says, oh, we didn't hit the bullseye. And so those predictions are being modulated. And it's saying, OK, next time I need to kind of fine tune that motor control to, to give us a, a better response. So it's constantly kind of updating and predicting what that action is going to do. And then getting information from the senses to see how good that prediction was and it kind of modulates that in the future. So this is really important for fine-tuning some of the, the really fine motor skills that we have. The basal ganglia is what's really important for actually initiating action. Um, and we'll see this has uh, input from a lot of these cortical regions. And so this is kind of the gatekeeper, as we'll talk about later. 
Um, it's just, it decides which action plan actually goes forward. So don't memorize all of these brain regions, putting it up here for those of you that are interested. Uh, and so it's a collection of these five different nuclei. And so you have the caudate and the putamen is kind of this, this funky looking uh, structure over here in the middle. And that's referred to in the literature as the striatum. Probably heard that a lot. It's linked to reward type stuff. Um, and then the globus pallidus and the subthalamic thalamic nuclei and the substantia nigra. Substantia nigra is something we've talked about before. That's going to come up later in the lecture when we talk about Parkinson's disease. Um, but this thing is very well mapped out. We know what the flow of information looks like. So input is coming into these structures here in the middle. So these, uh, the striatum. And then input is coming out of the global pallidus, which is here, and the substantia nigra. And so that's what's actually sending the motor signals out. And so we'll see this is really important for kind of learning new actions. Um, the role of the substantia nigra and the dopamine it produces. Um, but when we're not learning new things, this whole system is very habitual. It causes us to do the same types of actions over and over and over again until we learn something new. And we'll come back to that, so don't worry about taking too many notes on this because we're going to talk about it at the end of the lecture. So the pyramidal track is the one that's a lot more new, evolution, evolutionarily speaking. Uh, so it consists of axons that project directly from the cortex through the spinal cord. So I was mentioning that it kind of resembles a pyramid. That's why it was called the pyramidal tract. Um, and these are the longest neurons in the brain. So really, really long. They have axons that will go <laughs> directly from the cortex, like kind of all the way out through to the limbs. And this was what I was hinting at on that other slide. And we'll see on this next slide how this is achieved. But this allows us to have really, really fine-tuned control over muscles. Um, and it's mainly control over things that need very dexterous type control. So our fingers, uh, things for manipulating tools and stuff like that. That's why higher order mammals are able to achieve a lot more with their limbs than some other animals are. So newer system, direct control over the muscles. It doesn't have to send signals to the spinal cord and then let the spinal cord control the muscles. It has direct control over those muscles. And these, a lot of these projections are coming from primary motor cortex. So this is kind of the, the back end of the frontal lobe. This is the, the borderline of the intersection between, this is the parietal lobe back here, frontal lobe up here, and this is where the two of them meet. Um, I don't know if you guys remember from when we did senses, but the primary somatosensory cortex is right behind it. Um, and so it's using that map of the body from the primary somatosensory cortex to make a lot of its action plans and things. So um, on your slides, I changed these words. It had rostral and caudal. Um, I use the terms posterior and anterior a lot more commonly. Um, and so the, the, I was using the terms from the book, but I'm going to try to stay consistent and use terms that are used pretty frequently to describe brain regions and things like that. So this posterior region, which is further back, so the, the area that kind of lines up with the somatosensory cortex back here, um, is a lot more uh, older evolutionarily. And then the more anterior region is the region I was referring to in the last slide that has the direct control. And so these anterior axons can synapse directly onto the alpha neurons. And so instead of synapsing onto an inner neuron, so going down into the spinal cord, telling the spinal cord to do something, and then having the spinal cord talk to the muscles, this thing is dr talking directly to the neurons that are controlling the muscles. And so this is really, really important for dexterous type movements, our ability to manipulate tools and things like that. And this is mostly seen in the upper limbs, because those are the, the limbs that we need the most control of for those dexterous type movements. So primary motor. So this is where, um, and it's kind of interesting, everything we've talked about so far has talked about how the primary cortex is kind of the first area that information comes into, but we're thinking kind of in, in an opposite way here. Uh, this is where information goes to and then gets sent out. 
So everything we've talked about so far has been about bringing information in and processing that information. And this is talking about sending signals back out. So primary is one of like the last things that gets the information before it goes out. And we'll talk about that on, I think this, yeah, on one of these next slides I'll show you. So I hinted here that it's lined up with the somatosensory cortex. And so we have a somatotopic map. So we have a map of the body on, uh, and I highlighted this, this wasn't highlighted in your slides, but this is an important point that I want you guys to know. Um, that even though we have a map of the body in primary motor cortex, it's not as distinct as the one that we have in the somatosensory cortex. So somatosensory cortex is really important for sensing touch all over the body. So we want to make sure that we have all of those body parts represented. But in the primary motor cortex, we really only want representation for the things that we actively control, right? So representation is related to amount of use and our need for being able to move those limbs. So even though we can feel things on our back, we don't move the back as much as we move the hands and things like that. So the representation is a lot smaller. Fingers take up a ton of real estate because that's what we're moving the most. That's what we're manipulating things with the most. This point in the middle is really, uh, I've never done it before, but I've talked to people who have, and this is like the oddest sensation in the world from what I've heard. Uh, you can actually map out this map by using TMS. And so remember, TMS is the method that allows us to turn on and off neurons. And so you put this like magnetic coil on someone's head, and as you move it across this map, it makes those different body parts switch. Creepy. <laughs> like, I don't know how I feel about that. Don't do TMS on me. So remember that this is not as distinct. So it doesn't represent as much of the body as the somatosensory cortex does. And it's related to the amount of use that we have for those different things. And so kind of getting into the, the flow of information that I was just talking about. So up until now, we've talked about things coming in, and now we're talking about things coming out. And so what we have is we have all of these regions that we've talked about so far. We have like the, the ventral stream that's figuring out where things are in space. We have the dorsal stream that's figuring out what things are and processing perceptions and things like that. All of those things are passing to these secondary motor areas. And so these secondary motor areas are taking all of that information and they're making plans about what to do with that information, about what to move. And so the information is kind of flowing in an opposite direction this way. So the secondary areas are actually getting the information first. And then they're making plans about what to do with that information. And then they're sending it to pre or to the primary motor cortex to initiate the motion. So pre-motor is this guy right here in blue. And this one gets a lot of input, input from the parietal lobe. And so this is the ventral stream, the stream that's figuring out where things are in space, where the body is in space. So the, 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 the brain needs to know where everything is in order to decide how it wants to move it. The supplementary, supplementary area, motor, uh, air, motor areas, God, I can't talk today, um, has stronger connections with the frontal lobe. And the frontal lobe has been implicated in goals and preferences and planning and things like that. So you have this premotor area is receiving information about where everything is. Supplementary uh, motor area is receiving information about what the brain wants to do. And then both of those are feeding information into the primary motor area saying, okay, I know where everything is. I know what our goals are. How do we combine that information to make a legitimate action plan and to move the body in order to achieve those goals? So we kind of see that all of these different systems are all kind of working together in order to accomplish this stuff. So I want you to know premotor is really important for space. It's talking to the ventral stream and the parietal lobe. And then supplementary motor areas are really important for figuring out what our state is right now, what our goals are, what we want to achieve. And that's coming from the frontal lobe. And we'll talk more about that when we get into cortical control and things like that in the future. 
So this one, I don't want you to memorize this for the test or anything. Uh, this is just kind of a, an interesting piece of information. Uh, one of the reasons I don't want you to have to remember this is because calling something the dorsal dorsal stream is kind of stupid, in my opinion. Don't memorize that. Uh, <laughs> So the, the idea here is that there's different types of motion based on where things are in space. So this dorsal dorsal stream that kind of comes up the highest part of the parietal lobe is really important for reaching type motions. Uh, and then the ventral, the stream that goes a little bit kind of further down is more involved with the manipulation of things and for moving our hands in specific ways. And so this one on the top is actually taking advantage a lot more of the location information from the, the parietal lobe. It's figuring out where things are and where we need to move our limbs in order to get to those targets. Um, and then this one is more interested in kind of this fine-tuned motor control. So uh, don't memorize that. That's just kind of some, some context and some tidbit for those that are interested. And then our ventral stream is, is still involved. So this is the what pathway, remember. Um, and this one is processing what, it's identifying what we're looking at, and then it's sending that information to the frontal lobe to kind of figure out what those things mean for our goals and our intentions and things like that. So we have other regions that are devoted to very specific types of mo movement. So Broca's area, which is up here, is really important for producing speech movements. And this area is lateralized. It's, uh, it's on the left half of the brain. And so uh, language itself only comes from the left half of the brain. So patients that have had a colost uh, colostomy, that have had their corpus callosum cut, uh, if you show things to their left visual field and it goes to the right half of the brain, they're not able to tell you what it was because language is only on the left half of the brain. Kind of interesting. Uh, we have the frontal eye fields. So that's this area right here in the frontal lobe. These are really important for deciding where our eyes are moving and where they're going in space. And then the anterior cingulate cortex, this is pulled directly from the book, but um, I don't put a ton of credence into this. Anterior cingulate cortex is one of the most misunderstood regions of the brain. Um, we, it's, when you do MRI stuff, this pops up for almost every single kind of task that you do. Anterior cingulate cortex is really, really involved in everything. And it kind of makes sense because it's it's this kind of area right here, right above all of that subcortical stuff. And so it's kind of a super highway of information. There's tons of stuff passing through that area going to all the different parts of the brain. So there's, there's a lot of people that think that it's involved in evaluating how much effort is involved and things like that. But I don't think this is as clear cut as as it may seem in the book. So there's some studies we'll look at later that take advantage of the fact that the frontal eye field is involved in these motion signals and things like that, and they can manipulate it. Um, this other stuff is just kind of uh, context, nothing I'm gonna necessarily test you on. Cool, so that was kind of the anatomy as a whole kind of this tour of the different regions that are playing different roles. Uh, but now we're going to look at, at how that movement is actually being created and what different pieces of the puzzle are being put together to be able to make that happen. And this is something, this is such a cool experiment, in my opinion. Um, they figured out that there were these action sequences that were embedded in the spinal cord. And so what they did, so this was Sherrington. So this was a guy that I mentioned on the, the first day of class, did a lot of work with uh, reflexes and things like that. And he, I would not be able to do animal work. Like, yeah, this is just like so sad. But uh, so he, he severed the spinal cord from the brain in these cats. And so the brain itself was not able to receive any type of sensory information and it wasn't able to send any motor commands out. But he put these cats on this like kitty treadmill and what he found was that they were still making walking motions. So there was no sensory input going to the brain. There were no commands coming down from the brain, yet there were still these patterns of motion that were coming directly from the spinal cord. And so that's what I'm referring to as central pattern generation to generators. So without any input at all from the cortex, 
the spinal cord is able to put together these sequences of motion. So what we think and what we'll kind of explore in these next couple of slides is that the highest levels of the hierarchy that we talked about, the actual command center, um, is only sending out what it wants to do. It's not actually forming a plan of how to do that. It's just saying, I want to move. And then the spinal cord is like, I know how to do that. I will move. Um, this is really interesting when you think about sports that you've played in the past, right? If you really, really think about it, a lot of that thinking gets in the way. If you try to like fine tune every little muscle movement and everything, it's important at first, it really is. You have to learn how to shoot the ball. But once you know how to shoot the ball, forgetting about it, not thinking is actually what makes you the best. And it's because all of that is embedded in the spinal cord, that's muscle memory. We're fine tuning these reflex patterns with our cortical control. And this was actual electrical activity from those muscles. And so the muscles are still getting stuff from the spinal cord. So they did this study because they were, once we figured this out, we figured out that like, okay, the spinal cord is doing a lot of the work. So what is it that the brain is actually putting together? What kind of commands are coming from the brain? Um, and there were two ideas. One of the ideas was Okay, the brain is telling the spinal cord how it should get somewhere. And that's what they call trajectory-based coding. We'll look at it in a second. And so that was the first idea that came out from researchers. It was like, okay, the brain is telling, it knows where it wants to go, and it's sending these commands to the spinal cord. It's like, okay, I need to move the arm in this type of emotion to get there. The other kind of competing thing that we'll look at here in a second was more location-based stuff. The command is just saying, I want to get there and the spinal cord takes, for, takes care of the rest. So they did this, this study where they had these monkeys, again, just like would not be able to do this, but uh, they underwent uh, surgery and they severed all sensory input to the brain. So they didn't sever actual like command input that's coming down, but these monkeys were not able to feel anything. So they were able to still control the muscles, but they weren't able to feel any of the feedback coming from those muscles. And they trained them before they did this to do this pointing experiment where they would have a target that would pop up and they had to reach their arm and touch the target. And it was where this light flash occurred. So what they did was the, the monkey couldn't see his hand or anything and they applied a bunch of torque force to the arm. And so the light would come up, they needed to reach the arm to touch that thing, but they had this force being put on their arm and the monkey couldn't feel the force. And so if it was trajectory-based coding, if the brain was telling the arm how to get there, then it probably would have fallen short of the, the target because it thinks that the arm is moving, right? But the, it's actually stuck in place. And so when the torque comes off, it should only go like halfway to the target instead of all the way to the target. But what they found was that when the torque was removed, the arm immediately went straight to the target. And so it was this idea that the brain itself is not telling the arm how to get there, it's just telling it where to go. And the spinal cord and everything knows how to initiate those movements. So that's kind of, that's this idea of in-point control, that it knows where it wants to go and it, the rest does all the stuff. And so like, if you hear like uh, stuff from like the, the Buddhist meditators and everything, teaching someone how to like shoot a bow and arrow, it's like, just look at where you want it to go. Don't think about how to do it. Just think about where you want it to go. And the body will do the rest. Pretty amazing. If you've ever played beer pong, you had like the best game of your life. You're not thinking about it. It's just happening, right? Those reflexes, that muscle memory is something that's habitual. It's something that the, the brain doesn't need to interfere with at all. But our ability to interfere with that is what makes our actions flexible. It's saying, okay, we have these, these reflexes. We have these habitual things in place. But if that doesn't apply to this situation, I can turn that reflex off and I can modulate it. But movements don't always require this like one simple endpoint, right? There's usually a sequence of things that have to happen, multiple different muscles that all have to move kind of in accordance with one another. I love these dorky cartoons from the textbook. Uh, <laughs> Dance? Why, yes. <laughs> I mean, I love how they're like blowing gender stereotypes out of the water. Like it's the girl asking him to dance, which is pretty cool. 
Um, but when this happens, this person has a bunch of different things that they can do, right? They have a bunch of different choices. They can say, yeah, I'd love to, or they can move their hand to accept her hand, or they can do this stupid wink, <laughs> right? Uh, and when they finally decide on which one of these actions they want to, when the brain decides on one of these action plans, it has to put together a chunk of different sequences that all go to different muscles, right? So it chunks together these integrated muscle commands. So it's like, okay, I need to move the arm to grab her hand. I need to send uh, commands to the legs to be able to stand up and to push off of the chair. And so that's kind of what's going on in the brain. Is it's like it's calculating all of these different endpoints, and then it's sending these chunks of sequences down to the spinal cord, and the spinal cord is taking care of the rest. So we have conceptual stuff at the top. That's kind of the goal. Like I want to stand up and dance with this pretty lady. Uh, and then the goal is transferred into these effector sequences. So in order to do that, I need to grab her hand. I need to move my legs. I need to stand up. And those sequences are sent to the proper central pattern generators. Uh, so the, the parts of the spinal cord that know how to do all that movement. So this is what I, I was hinting at earlier. So these, these motions are not something that are unique to humans, right? This is a really cool picture. You know, these, these animals are able to achieve these amazingly complex actions and to, to grab this grasshopper right out of the middle of the air, right? Uh, but these animals don't have the same kind of cortex that we have. And our cortex is kind of superimposed on this other control system. So this is that extra pyramidal tract that I talked about, the subcortical control system. And that's what these animals are kind of using, is this older evolutionarily uh, habitual response. It's instinctual. We have all of these action plans that are built in over hundreds and thousands of years of evolution, where these animals do these same motions over and over and over again, that there's no thinking that's really required. But as the system gets more complex, it allows for more fine tuning of those simple reflexes. And so you have some of these brainstem nuclei are able to do this. So like the basal ganglia and the cerebellum that start popping up in even creatures like this. Um, but then as we get more complex, as we get to mammals, we have cortical stuff that is able to be really, really flexible. We can have really complex goals, really complex perceptions that are all mingled <coughs> together and and merge together to form different types of actions that we've never done before. And this is something that's really important right here, is that this cortical spinal tract, this is the pyramidal tract. I should have just put pyramidal. I was using pyramidal earlier. I apologize for that. So the pyramidal tract is only evident in mammals. So this direct control that we have over uh, upper limbs and dexterous type things, it's only found in mammals. And so it's something that as evolution progressed and we needed more fine-tuned and flexible motion, it was like, I need to bypass the, this habit system completely, this reflex system, and I want just direct control over the things that, that I use the most. That's why the frontal lobe is so big, oops, and humans and monkeys and those kind of things. So this started to, so we're going to zoom in now and start looking at single cells and how this might be happening kind of at the cellular level. And so they, they did this study with, with monkeys where they were recording from single cells in the primary motor cortex. And this task itself was something where they had their, their arm on a lever and one of these circles around this 360 degree target array would light up and they had to move that uh, that lever to one of those locations or move it back to the center. So a light would illuminate at one of the eight targets. Uh, it was a lot like a reaching motion like they would do in, in normal everyday life. It involved moving the elbow and moving the shoulder. And what they found was these cells in the primary motor cortex were really specific to the direction of that motion. So the figure here, so this both of these figures, the top and the bottom, are both showing the same cell. And what you notice is that it's very, very interested in motion that's towards the animal. 
And so when it's pulling the lever to these targets that are in the back that are closer to itself, the cell is really interested in the motion coming that way. And it's also happening when he's returning to the center from these other ones. So all of that motion is towards the animal. And so we notice that these cells are very interested in this kind of directional type tuning. Oops. But something that you'll notice and something that we're going to go over on this next slide is that this is a very broad tuning, right? These aren't specific for like left or right. Uh, this same cell will fire for kind of a broad generalization of a direction. And that's really important for understanding uh, this next slide. Because what we think is happening is that the brain isn't just using one cell, it's using ensemble coding like we talked about in past lectures. It's using patterns of different cells that have different tuning curves and it's putting those all together to get an idea of the actual direction. And so that's where we start to look at population vectors. And so this was something that researchers realized that if instead of just recording from one cell, if we record from a bunch of cells and we kind of get an idea of the direction that all of these cells like, and then we put all those together, we get a much better uh, uh, prediction of the actual direction that the animal is moving. So this was this idea that the tuning is really, really broad. We saw that on the last one. So it's interested in this entire half of the circle pretty much. But when we combine these signals with cells with other directional tuning, we start to see a clearer picture. That's what this little diagram down here in the bottom left is showing, is that when we combine one that has kind of a, a 180 degree to the left and then kind of a 90 degree up and down, we get this black line of the actual motion. Uh, and then same thing here. If we, we have something that's only like a 90 degree angle to the left, but 180 degree angle kind of up and away from the animal, we get uh, a vector that kind of goes that way. And they, they started to see that once they did the math on this and combined all of these different cells together, they were able, just by looking at the cell activity, they were able to predict which direction the animal moved the lever in, um, in both 2D and 3D space. So this gave them really powerful predictive power. And this kind of, this is more evidence for that ensemble coding that we were talking about, that maybe it's this pattern of activity that's, that's cueing things and not just individual cells, which is kind of philosophical quicksand, because like, how does that work? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so and this was interesting right here, this last point. Uh, activation in these population vectors was there 300 milliseconds before they moved. And so these were linked to the planning phase. So this, this was the direction they were about to move in. There are some people that think that this like disproves free will, but I don't know. But like they've picked these signals up in humans that show that they can predict which way someone was going to move before they were consciously aware of which way they decided to move. And it was like a big study that was like free will doesn't exist. Our brain is making the decisions without us. <laughs> Yeah, and that's it exactly. There's there's a lot of holes in it. I don't necessarily buy it. I think free will is really important for maintaining control over our body and for producing health outcomes. So this is not something I'm going to test you on, but this is just something uh, I thought was really interesting. So what they found was that not all of these cells in the primary motor cortex were tuned to direction and that some of them actually had different tuning based on what part of the action they were in. Um, and so what we've seen so far as far as like single cell recordings and like sensory stuff and things like that is that they have very specific receptive fields. They'll light up for a very specific orientation or a very specific color or an object. These ones would fire differently for a lot of different things. And so they started to create these dynamic models where they were, instead of just modeling it as just tuning for direction, it was tuning for a bunch of different things. Um, and they were actually able to create much better models of the motion with these dynamic models. And they were just using simple things like direction. So like I said, this isn't something I'm going to test you on. This is just kind of where the field is moving. Um, this requires a lot of computational power, predictive models and things like that. Um, and that's why these things are popping up because you can analyze like hundreds and thousands of cells at once and plug all these different parameters in. 
but it's it may not just be as simple as we just looked at. And that was kind of what I wanted to get across in this in this slide was that even though we found evidence that these cells are firing for a specific direction, there may be a lot more to the story that we just don't know yet. All right, so goal selection. So how is it that we're actually deciding what to do? So we saw how we do it, how we generate these motions, um, but what regions of the brain are involved in actually planning these things out and choosing which things we want to do. And like this, I, I chose this picture in the background because the act of picking up a coffee cup, bringing it to your mouth and sipping on it without burning your tongue is a very, very complex motion. Like it involves a very fine tuned sequence of, of events without spilling it, tipping it at just the right angle so that you don't get too much and burn everything. Um, and so there's a lot going into very simple everyday things that we kind of take for granted. So there's, this is the, a big theory in the field right now in action planning. Um, I don't want you to memorize the, the hypothesis or the, the theory. Um, what I want you to get out of it uh, is what we'll go over in kind of the next couple of slides. But the idea is that there's a lot of different stuff going on in our environment at any given time. And so there's a bunch of different actions that we could choose. Uh, like here, we could choose to run away, we could choose to fight, we could choose to throw something at it to help our friend, all these different things. This is evolutionarily uh, driven, the theory is, because we have all of these different goals and things going on at every any given moment. And this is, this is a really simple idea, right? This is kind of the beginning of, of human evolution, where we were kind of at the bottom of Maslow's pyramid, where we were being driven by things like hunger and thirst, and that was driving our action plan. But in today's world, those action plans are way more complex. We have social influences. We have goals about class. We have goals about our family and our relationships and all those kind of things. So there's a lot of different things that the brain is weighing when it's deciding what to do. And this was an older idea was that, uh, that we were kind of every single thing that happened, we were like serially processing it. We were like, okay, what about this idea? What about this idea? But when you really look at evolution, these things need to happen fast. And so what we'll go over in the next couple of slides is that they think that a lot of these different action plans are actually happening in parallel that we have a lot of different ideas kind of in mind at, at one time, and they're competing with one another, and then there's these control mechanisms that will choose one of those action plans. And there's some really cool evidence that we'll look at in the next slides for that. So multiple plans in parallel. So this is something I was hinting at at the beginning of the lecture. Action is complex. A lot of stuff going on here. And there's a lot of stuff in this diagram that we've talked a lot about, right? This is the ventral stream. So this is object identity, so visual cortex to this kind of interior temporal lobe is identifying objects. Those objects are being used to see how relevant it is for our behavior, how relevant it is for our goals. Uh, there's stuff coming from OFC down here about reward and about how, how much that's gonna pay off in the, in the long term. Uh, we have our, our dorsal stream right here that's figuring out where things are in space. It's attending to those things in space, and it's using those things to uh, kind of modulate the way that things are happening. And then we have all of this subcortical stuff that's actually like biasing whether or not those <laughs> actions actually go out. Um, the plans are kind of happening all at once. There's all of this stuff going on, and so there's tons of different comparisons all happening at any given moment. And it's using these, these sensory feedback loops. And so it's like, okay, I have a plan. What is the environment telling me about that plan? What's coming from the senses? What's giving me some kind of an idea about whether or not that's a good plan or not? Um, and so all of that stuff is kind of happening over here in the frontal lobe. And it's using all of the sensory information that's going through these perceptual streams that we've talked about over the last couple of lectures in order to decide what it is that they're gonna do next. So this involves internal states, so understanding how our body feels right now, uh, long range and short range, goal, short range goals, these expected rewards that I talked about that are coming from OFC. Um, they're all used to kind of provide all of this information. And what the kind of takeaway idea is here is that these action plans are all competing with one another. It's like, I want to control behavior. No, I don't want to control behavior. 
Um, and there's mechanisms in place that decide which information is the most important for any given goal or any given moment. And that one ends up winning out in kind of a winner take all scenario. And this was a really, really cool study that showed that. Um, so this was a, uh, a study that was looking at single cells in monkeys. And so the animal was presented with these two targets, so a blue circle and a red circle. And they noticed in these cells that there were these plans developing for both of them. So it was like, okay, I'm ready to move to the red one, but I'm also ready to move to the blue one. And that was there. And then all of a sudden, so this is the memory period. This is where both of those action plans are taking place together and they're kind of competing with one another. And then there was this delay period, which is this right here. And then after that, there was a queue. And so it was like, I want you to move to the red one. After the queue, the blue plan falls off and the red plan wins. And so this is the competition kind of being resolved at this point. Right? And then there's the go signal of like actually move. And so this whole period right here between the, the cue of which color you're gonna move to and the actual cue to finally move, this is the planning phase and this is the motion phase. And so big idea is that there was neural signatures for both plans. So both things were kind of being processed in parallel. And then once the, the brain had enough information, once it got information from its environment about which one was the most important, then that one won out. And it started to produce the, the plan to initiate the action and eventually actually initiate it. So the scales were tipped toward that one. So really, really clear demonstration of this parallel processing and this competing hypothesis. Cool demonstration. All right, this is where I want you guys to use your papers and two pencils. So, I want you guys to try to draw this with both hands. Same time. So I want you to draw two U's like this, just like this. This one up here is, is somewhat easy compared to the other one. Because now, after you do this one, I want you to do this. This one down here on the bottom. So I want you to do kind of a sideways one with one hand and an up and down one with the other hand. <laughs> and try to do it like fluidly. If you're if you're stopping, it kind of defeats the point. You, you can look at it, yeah. But the, the idea is that you want to do it fluidly at the same time without stopping. It's really hard to do. This one is not easy. The reason that this one up here is really easy is because you're initiating the exact same action command to both hands at the same time. Both hands are doing the same thing. Down here, you have two action plans that are competing with one another, and one of them is winning out at any given time. You'll notice that you're really good at one and crappy at the other, and then you switch to the other one, and you're like, oh, I'm good at that one, oh, now I'm bad at the other one, right? So it's kind of a winner-take-all thing. Split brain patients don't have a problem with this. So if you cut the communication between the two hemispheres, those things are not competing with one another anymore and the two hemispheres are doing things on their own. Split brain patients can actually draw a square and a circle at the same time. Try doing that. What is really interesting about split brain patients is that there's this idea that they have two different forms of consciousness kind of operating at the same time. And there's this thing called alien hand syndrome with split brain patients where both of their hemispheres are actually doing their own thing. So they'll reach into the closet and the left hand wants to wear blue that day and the right hand's like, no, I want to wear red. And the right hand, without any type of like control from the participant, will just grab something else. I don't want a snicker, I want a Kit Kat. Like, and this is a really bizarre phenomenon. Once you cut off the communication between the two hemispheres, there's not a a single plan that's coming to like a head. There's two different plans operating kind of in parallel. Really interesting idea. So we're gonna go through links between action and perception real quick. This is a really cool idea. This kind of leads us into the mirror neuron stuff. So there were these people that started to look at uh, kind of these supplementary planning areas and they started to find that there's this vocabulary for different actions where cells were firing for specific types of action motions. Firing for grasping an object or firing for moving a hand or bringing something to the mouth. 
And they believed that these were kind of the building blocks for creating the, the overall motion plans that you went through. And these at first were found to be completely linked to the action of the animal. So when the animal was grasping something, you'd have one cell that was specific in the premotor cortex for, for grasping. And if you had that animal bringing something to its mouth, it was specific to that. And there was this lab that was studying this, Rizzolatti's lab, that uh, they had started to work out this different vocabulary and started to figure out which cells were firing for different things. And they had a monkey in the lab that was hooked up that the electrode was tuned into a cell that was specific for bringing things to the mouth. And they had seen it fire every time the, the animal brought something to its mouth, the cell was firing. And this guy, he walked in with a cone of gelato and he was just hanging out and the monkey was just doing his thing. And he went to lick the ice cream and the cell started firing. And the monkey wasn't moving. The monkey was watching him move. And this was the first evidence for these mirror neurons that like they totally found by accident, like really kind of a cool story. I don't know how true this is, but it's, it's a really kind of cool anecdote. Uh, but that really important thing here is that the monkey was not moving. And so they think that this is kind of the link between perception and action. And so they called these mirror neurons. This is what I was just getting at, kind of link between action and perception. And so these neurons are active for perceiving the motion, and they're also involved in actually producing the motion. So some are only active for production, some are only active when viewing, and some are active for both. And so a mirror neuron can refer to ones that are uh, active when they're viewing and for ones that are active for both. And so this monkey in this little uh, figure over here, there was a certain uh, neuron that would fire when it was cracking a peanut. The same neuron would fire when it saw the researcher crack a peanut. Same thing when they saw it through like a partition the neuron would fire when it heard a cracking peanut and it didn't see it. Uh, it would also fire when it thought that a researcher was reaching behind a partition to grab a peanut. Like, very, very fine-tuned. This was like the peanut cell. Uh, so these were also found in the parietal and temporal lobes. Uh, and so there's this idea that they're really, really widespread throughout the brain. Um, and that's important on this next one. So. So you guys have heard about this. I'm going to kind of move along. So just remember that these are kind of the link to perception and that they're, they're active, not just when we're moving, but when we're thinking about someone else moving. I got a question, Taylor. Yeah. Did, did it also fire if it wasn't paying attention? So if it was distracted, it was I don't know. I'll that's that. my, like, yeah, yeah. my question. Like, well, I mean, but that's, that gets into our attention lecture last yeah, time, right? So yeah. like, uh, are they actually attending to it? Are those signals boosted like, or not? Just sensors. Mm -hmm. So this is something that researchers think is really important for learning, especially in these higher order animals, that the reason that mammals are able to learn so much faster than other animals is because they believe we have more mirror neurons that are linking seeing someone do something to us then being able to do that same action. And this was some evidence from fMRI. So this first one was uh, they brought in skilled dancers and they had them watch videos of dance routines that they had done or dance routines that they hadn't done. And there's these different regions that we've all, all already found in uh, animal models that have mirror neurons were a lot more highly active when they were watching familiar dance routines versus unfamiliar ones. And so these neurons are tuned to the goals of the individual. And that kind of plays out in this study as well. So this study looked at pro basketball players, basketball journalists, and controls. And so the pros were people that have really, really uh, heavy experience in this. And then the journalists were ones that were kind of intermediates, and the controls were ones that didn't have a lot of active basketball experience. Uh, I'm going to just briefly talk about what a TMS motor evoke potential is. And so what they did was they put TMS over the region of the brain that uh, controls the arm. And they didn't activate those, those neurons. They hyper excited. They made it so that those neurons would be excited really, really easily. If any kind of input came to those neurons, they would send a signal. And what they did was they showed them videos of either people doing basketball shots or people doing soccer shots. And they measured actual electric, electric activity from the arm. 
And so they were making it so those neurons would fire really easily, and then they were measuring whether or not a signal actually got sent to the arm. And when the pros and the, and the journalists were watching the basketball stuff, they had really heightened levels of activity in their arm compared to the people, compared to the controls, and compared to when watching soccer, which they didn't have a lot of experience with. I thought this was kind of a stupid like comparison at first, because I was like, why are you measuring activity from the arm for soccer? Because soccer doesn't activate the arms, it activates the legs, but the controls had activity for in the arm for both basketball and soccer. So it kind of proved me wrong. <laughs> Um, the, the kind of interesting thing here is this last bullet point, though, is that the, the pros actually showed greater activity when the shot was going to be successful. So they had much more experience with those motions, and they were able to predict which motions were going to be ones that ended up being a shot or not. So really interesting idea with mirror neurons. Cool. So we'll go through subcortical control. Um, I'm going to highlight some main points because there's some kind of uh, complex wiring with some of this stuff. But I'll, I'll give you guys the takeaways and what, what I really want you guys to know out of this because uh, I want to get to this stuff at the end. So basal ganglia is uh, kind of that portion in the middle of the brain right around the thalamus. Uh, and it is considered the gatekeeper of the brain. And so we have all of these action plans happening in the cortex. And the basal ganglia is the one that actually decides which action plan goes forward. Um, it has an indirect path that is for stability and posture. So this is kind of that habitual type activity I was talking about. And then it has a direct path that is deciding what action comes from the cortex and moves down. Um, so this was kind of what I was hinting at when we were talking about the competing plans. And so once the basal ganglia decides what plan it wants to initiate, it inhibits the other ones. And it actually has really strong inhibitory baseline activity, which means it allows for a bunch of different plans to be kind of considered. And then once a plan is decided on, it'll inhibit everything and it'll excite the one that needs to go through. And this is kind of a winner take all system. That's what we were just talking about. And that's what you guys just demonstrated to yourself is that there's usually just one action plan that wins out. And that's why it's really hard to have your hands do different things at the same time. So what I want you to know here is that uh, the basal ganglia is really important for initiating actions. It decides which plan kind of goes forward. And that all comes from the direct path. This indirect path is just kind of the stability and posture one. Um, and you know what, I'm going to skip over this, so don't worry about this. Uh, this is just talking about how dopamine, so I highlighted here, it's not highlighted on your, on your slides. I'm not going to do a test question because I'm going to kind of rush through this. Um, but dopamine kind of marks actions that were, uh, that were successful. And so it kind of potentiates those actions and makes it more likely that those actions will be initiated in the future. So it produces really strong excitatory stuff in the direct pathway, and then it shuts down all of the habitual stuff in the indirect pathway. And dopamine is the main driver of that. And that's why it's really important for Parkinson's disease. Because in Parkinson's, you have this inability to produce voluntary mo motion. motion movement. Uh, I can't freaking talk today. So. Uh, what happens is when the substantia nigra starts losing these dopamine neurons, there's no more excitatory control. And so the basal ganglia is just always inhibitory. And so it's shutting down all action plan. And so nothing gets through. And so what they do is they give them L-dopa, which increases the amount of dopamine in those areas. And what you see from uh, Parkinson's patients when they're shaking, that's actually a side effect from the L-dopa because that's producing excess motion. It's not very fine-tuned, controlled motion. Um, here, the only thing I want you to take away from here is that the substantia nigra is the important part for Parkinson's. So just make sure you're linking Parkinson's to substantia nigra. Um, but here, they also do deep brain stimulation. And so they'll put this probe way down at the subthalamic nucleus. And the subthalamic nucleus is what actually gets the signals from the substantia nigra. So if the substantia nigra is not working, 
they're just bypassing it and they're activating this thing manually. Um, and the thing is, like uh, with a lot of this, uh, once the dopamine neurons are gone, there's not a lot that can be done because it's neurodegenerative. So these dopamine neurons will keep dying, but El dopa is not going to work if there's no neurons to actually accept them. The cerebellum. So they did, this is a really new technique in uh, molecular neuroscience. It's really cool. It allows to actually visualize activity in real time. Um, and so they were doing this imaging with, with rats, and they found that neurons in the cerebellum were activating when the uh, rat was pushing the lever. They were linked to the velocity of the press. But then there was this whole collection of cells that were linked to what the outcome was, whether or not that, that action uh, resulted in some kind of a reward. And this led to this idea that the cerebellum, this is something I talked about at the beginning of the lecture, has predictive power. And so it's basically, it's making predictions about what an action is going to do. It's comparing that to what actually happened. And then it's changing how that motion is then created in the future try to bring the outcomes and the predictions kind of together. And I'll, I'll come back to this. So the, the main idea here that I want you to link is cerebellum is predictive. It's predicting what an action is going to do. And I'll demonstrate that on this next slide. Because this is what I wanted to get to, but it's action learning. So this is something, I don't know if you guys did this in biopsych. I know uh, Paul really likes this task, uh, but I know you, a lot of you guys have Matt Smear. Um, and so what they do is they, they have people throw a ball at a target, and then they put prism glasses on them. And so it throws your vision off. And at first, you're really bad at it, but then your system adapts to it, and you start to get really good. And then you take the glasses off, and your system has adapted, and it's like, oh, crap, now we're off again. <laughs> And then it readapts, it comes back. So a really cool idea. Um, and what I'll show you, so when the glasses are removed, I have to readapt to get it back to normal. Um, this is what I wanted to get to, is when the cerebellum is damaged, people don't adapt. And so it's really heavily involved in this predictive power, right? The cerebellum is predicting where that ball should hit it's seeing that the ball didn't hit there, and then it's readjusting that motion on the next try to try to bring it in with the prediction. So this is just highlighting again, right? Cerebellum is really important in predicting what that motor's command is actually going to do. So when we talk about the cerebellum fine-tuning things, that's what we're talking about. So it's making predictions about what's going to happen, and then it's fine-tuning that action next time to be more in line with what the prediction should actually be. And I just have just a couple more slides. we got like one more minute. Um, so this is one of my favorite researchers of all time, David Eagleman. Really, really cool research that he did. Uh, he actually left academia. Um, but this, it was this idea that during learning, there's this huge increase in the cortex. We're planning how that motion is going to happen. But as we learn, that activity is no longer necessary because all of it's been transferred to the muscles. And the muscles know what to do. So as accuracy improves, this activity, it dies off. And so what we're seeing over here, so this was a professional cup, uh, cup stacking champion, right? And this was David Eagleman, who sucked at cup, cup, cup stacking. God, I can't talk. Uh, and what they were looking at was this EEG activity. And so David Eagleman, while he's doing this, he's having to really think about the entire sequence, and his cortex is just lighting up. And this kid, who has done this millions of times, his cortex is virtually silent. He's just letting his hands do the work, right? So it's this idea that thinking really gets in the way once action has been learned. And this just ties it all together. So as someone gets really good at something, the activity shifts to more of these subcortical structures that are important for the habits, that doing actions that we do all the time. And so this was found in rats. So if we lesion the primary motor cortex, if something's already learned, they're still able to do it. And so what we think is that experts are able to use the cortex to kind of fine tune those habitual circuits. So we're able to kind of suppress the evolutionarily old stuff and we're able to fine tune it and create new circuits. And that's it. Cool.
Yeah. That was a fun one.